So it is my pleasure this morning to welcome you both here and introduce our distinguished guest, Mr. Stephen Shula, who is a Supervisory Intelligence Analyst, working as the Branch Chief for the Weapons of Mass Destruction Analyst Analysis Branch within the J2 Directorate at US STRATCOM at Office Air Force Base. In this capacity, Mr. Shula supervises eight or 10, I think as he told me this morning, civilian WMD analysts and oversees daily branch production and analysis in support of US Strategic Command. Um, originally immersed in the WMD arena during his tour in Hawaii um, at Joint Intelligence Center Pacific, he has continued to follow WMD issues um, in each of his subsequent follow-on assignments. Uh, Mr. Shula is a prior service intelligence officer with 13 years experience in the United States Air Force. He started his career um, working U2 wet film imagery exploitation, which hopefully we might hear a little bit about. So, so just to interrupt. Yes, of course. So the key mission of that wet film exploitation was primarily PSYOP. The entire mission was so that when the United States launched nukes at its enemies, the U2 flew with wet film because that was the only thing that was going to work after a nuclear event. And so those aircraft and those pilots would fly over the nuclear web, uh, nuclear strike points, take pictures with the wet film, and then come back to an undisclosed location where we would offload the film and analyze it for how well we did. So that was the primary mission that we trained and fought for. Today. And perhaps technology has changed a little bit. Yeah, even, even now with electronic imagery and all that, the web film imagery for that particular mission still stands today. It's iris or uh, optical bar camera or OBC film. So. Well, we're going to have a lot to talk about. I'm not even going to make it through the rest of my bio because he has such a diverse and interesting set of experiences, um, including as a watch officer, a WMD analyst, um, deployed to Saudi Arabia and Iraq during Southern Watch and Iraqi Freedom, a whole host of um, experiences. Um, hopefully we will hear a little bit about the training and how that is translated into today. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome um, Mr. Shula to this class. Let me just, one organizational point of clarification, there is a yellow ass assignment sheet, assignment sheet, excuse me, for those of you in my class who want to get an extra credit point. Make sure your name is on that sheet before the end of the class period. The floor is yours. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Appreciate it. Thanks for, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, Good morning. Um, first off, I just want to open by saying thank you for having me. And I'll just say up front, I don't like to do death by PowerPoint. So interrupt at will. Uh, I prefer it. As a matter of fact, just like you saw, um, I'd rather have your ideas. Just as a little bit of background, additional information about myself. I actually have a BS degree in physics. I hear there's some engineers in the room. Uh, let me tell you, when it comes to international affairs, it doesn't stop with the, with the international affairs studies. Uh, as a physicist, I never thought that when I got in the Air Force, as I was telling the professor as we were walking over, I never thought that I'd actually get to use my physics degree. And as a WMD guy, I use it every single day to decipher what the DOE, what the uh, national labs, and uh, all that electronic intelligence that comes out, how that comes down and forth in front of me, the science background ex is extremely helpful. Um, I can't tell you how much it's helped. Um, I hail from Albuquerque, New Mexico to give you a little bit of history. Um, as you know, New Mexico is known for nuclear everything, right? From Alamogordo and the first Trinity test to the Los Alamos um, Manhattan Project area. Growing up in New Mexico, you know, it's all you hear about is nuclear testing, nuclear this. Sandia Labs is in my back door. I got to do a uh, internship as a freshman with Sandia Labs. Um, all the professors in New Mexico were from Los Alamos or from Sandia. They had experience and had worked on nuclear weapon programs. Uh, and so you get that vibe. Uh, on top of the history there, so, you know, I studied it and, you know, followed the history and looked out and said, you know, it's, it's very interesting to follow, you know, uh, not just history in World War II and World War I, but how we've evolved with this nuclear weapon hanging over our heads, right? And how it's uh, expanded, moved, or not moved to other countries. Um, so without further ado, let's just get started and let's see uh, some of the talks. 
U.S. Strategic Command up front is, as my boss, General Hyten, would call it, is a worldwide war fighting command uh, under some company or military guys they call us a functional command because we're a global strategic command. Transcom, functional command, they transport stuff. Special ops, they do all that, you know, knife eating and black ops stuff. But really STRATCOM is the global war fighting command because whereas these two can do a lot of things independently, as our command, we must work with the combatant commands, UCOM, PACOM, CENTCOM. On a daily basis, we have to integrate our war plan with their war plans to make sure that we don't cross each other's paths, right? So we're talking nuclear strike is our main course, our main global mission. And uh, just, to, just to put a, a fine point on it, let me just give General Hyten to quote, U.S. DRACOM employs tailored nuclear cyber space, global strike, joint electronic warfare, missile defense, and intelligence capabilities to deter aggression. Decisively respond if deterrence fails, assure allies, shape adversary behavior, defeat terror, and define the force of the future. He always opens up when he's talking about the command because he has a real simple um, simple prior he has three priorities that he likes to talk about he talks one priority number one is strategic deterrence he wants to make sure that above all else we deter our adversaries from launching strategic attacks against the united states priority number two if deterrence fails we will prepare to deter or we will be prepared to deliver decisive response so that's the scary part of our mission right uh, if we need to, at a moment's notice, we'll re respond in kind for the, for the nation's goals. And then finally it says, priority three is to make sure those forces are always available and ready to go to accomplish that task. And that takes me to the missions at U.S. STRATCOM that we're trying to integrate. Commander's primary priorities, as you see, are right there. Um, the big deal that he has right now is all of these capabilities that I mentioned earlier, deterrence, assurance, space ops, cyberspace, General Hyten's primary focus today is to integrate across all those boxes. Over the years, we create stovepipes. It's a military tradition. Uh, as you become sharp and focused on one thing, you end up being really good at joint electronic warfare, but how do you integrate that back over to the strategic deterrence and assurance mission is always up in the air. You try to do the best when you're trying to accomplish things on the fly, but this mission is too important, as General Hyten would say, to do things on the fly. So now, right now, the command is working on integrating all of these things together with, if you pay attention to integrated missile defense as one of our subcomponent commands, that particular um, capability is come to the forefront, right? We talked about Korea and ICBMs and detecting launch and preparing the country from a possible attack and being able to maybe deter attack by having a, a much more integrated missile defense. Um, again, all of these uh, operations live at those combat commands on the previous page. So US DRACOM doesn't necessarily own the integrated missile defense system. It belongs to CENTCOM, it belongs to PACOM. It sits in the UCOM theater, and we have to manage it so that all of those signals are flowing in the proper order and getting back to the command so that we can react and operate from. So, let me see. Questions? Anything? Oh, no. Uh, so, key, key here, it's not just about dropping nukes, because if it was just about dropping nukes, we wouldn't even have a mission, right? We haven't done that since Hiroshima and Nagasaki 70 plus years ago. So while we maintain that we have our weapons that are workable and operable every day, and, and basically interject that to the global community 
of those other nuclear weapon interested parties like Russia, China, now Korea, and others, it's also about influencing those perceptions to make sure that the adversary understands while we don't want to use those weapons, we're ready and willing and able. Um, key, key factors there is strategic messaging. On a reg regular basis, you'll see things, let's just put it in context, just in the last three to four months since the Koreans tested their thermonuclear weapon in September, Strategic Command has uh, conducted a series of different um, messaging campaigns where they've flown B-1s, B-52s, uh, B-2s in the, in the Northeast Asia theater to let the, the, not only the Koreans know, but also the South Koreans, our partners, and the Japanese know that we're prepared to back them. Uh, we're prepared to support them if these, uh, if negotiations fail or if deterrence fails, uh, we will take care of, or if assurance fails, then we will deter. Um, whole of government, hard and soft power, um, diplomacy's out there too, right? I was uh, mentioning to the professor before we uh, came in, uh, we've had leadership at Stratcom in motion now for the last four to six months. Uh, since the nuclear test, since the ICBM tests in May and July, the leadership is bouncing around between Northeast Asia, Japan, Hawaii, DC, DC, and then DC some more, and then back to Northeast Asia. So uh, extremely busy, extremely, uh, uh, just this last uh, weekend, uh, General Heighton was at another meeting uh, a, more of an open forum, not, not unlike a proliferation forum that we're talking about today here in this group, just larger. Um, and uh, he reiterated some of those finer points at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if you guys paid attention to the news. He also iterated the idea about he'd be able to disobey, or not disobey is the word, but be able to say no to an unlawful order like launching a nuclear strike if it wasn't proportionate. And he went into a great depth both in uh, his, his previous, his predecessor, General Kaler, was in Congress last week, who brought this up on Tuesday last week, who said that um, every uh, airman, sailor, and soldier, civilian who works for the DOD uh, is taught the law of armed conflict. And part of the law of armed conflict teaches us proportionality. So if I, drop a bomb and kill all the people at this table with just a conventional bomb, it doesn't mean I can come over here and drop nukes on all the other tables just because I feel like it. It would be considered an illegal act. Striking back at our opponents with conventional forces, however, would be legal. Uh, if the opponent that we were targeting, say Korea, as they've advertised, um, conducting atmospheric nuclear tests or launching nuclear weapons that could put U.S. and or allies at risk. Um, that kind of changes that complexion, right? Now we're talking about a weapon that has the capacity to kill not just a thousand or a hundred, but possibly millions when it goes off in its local area. Um, yeah, so, so, he, so one of the things that he's been talking about is how you can ignore that order. And so, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I have a question on proportionality. So let's uh, let's assume that, for example, Koreans, uh, like, it's just an experiment. An experiment. Yeah, sure. The Koreans target one person, and uh, they, they, they bomb one, and they strike one, and they, they cause, like, let's say, 20,000 casualties. Right. Uh, what would be proportional? So, so the question there is, is that a declaration of war? It is, right? We're at ceasefire right now with the Koreans. And so, uh, from an upfront up point of view, in Steve's opinion, you start, you know, how you would strike back in North Korea if they launched it with a nuke. Um, you've taken some of the limitations off of the STRATCOM commander resisting using nukes coming back. Why? Because nuclear weapons against the North Koreans hardly deeply buried targets are actually an ideal way to 
minimize collateral damage against our allies, right? Especially, I hear there's folks from South Korea, yes? Especially South Korea, Osan's, you know, I've been to Osan, it's 30 miles from the border, it's within artillery shell range, not just artillery, but 7,000 to 10,000 pieces of artillery. So it can be obliterated very easily, sadly, from that range. And so the question of proportionality at that point is, if the war is declared, proportionally, how many people will be lost in Osan? Even though it's conventional, I can count up the numbers and, and now I can stop and say, maybe the mutually assured destruction or deterrence here using nukes could prevent the loss of my allied lives, eight million, right? Chemical attack. What's the best way to ruin, to ruin a chemical stockpile? Well, honestly, it's to nuke it, burn it. Um, and we don't have a lot of good capabilities that aren't nuclear, uh, in, just to be honest. So, it's, so, I mean, so part of that proportional question isn't just about what they do to us, but once the war is on, it's where the next step can fall, right? If, if I had a detection that they were gonna put a thermonuclear weapon on an ICBM and launch it towards the west coast of the United States, 20 million in the Los Angeles area, 10 or 15 million in the Washington area, or even at my SSBN pens, right up in Washington, now there's a worry there, right? So again, proportionality kind of opens the door for me to have a little more leeway if they start it. Because we're only at a ceasefire. I mean, if we're not at peace. This is the, uh, we have a, a big argument, you know, as to what would happen if, you know, someone uses tactical nukes on the battlefield in Europe, in Asia, in uh, South Asia, between Pakistan and India. Right, we have, we have an argument about how will one side be able to launch nukes of a small amount and the other side be able to go, well, I'll respond in kind, but only a little bit more. So at what point does the escalatory or the control factors get out of, get out of the way, right? Um, so the way we look at it from a U.S. Stratcom perspective is deter to win. Right? We don't, we don't want to get into this tit for tat. We want to get to a point where we can come to the table and say, are we done? We're either going to win or we're going to win. Or, or everybody loses, right? Especially when the, in this game. Does that kind of help? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a, that's a tough question, no, proportionality. In the sense, proportionality is not like, uh, you don't interpret it in, uh, because uh, proportionality is a term that can uh, interpret different Agreed. Yeah, different uh, interpretation. Yep. You know, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Same as proliferation. I have, a, I have a, about three different versions of what proliferation means to me that I follow on a regular basis. Let's see what's next. We have another question here, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope what I said. Back on the topic of like conflict escalation, does Stratcom, or is there concern about Stratcom coordinating? these proportional response techniques with allies like Japan or with Israel? Or is there like, uh, as if there's, I'm assuming that there's a direct effort with allies to make sure that they respond proportionally so that if they act in their own interest, it's that it doesn't escalate the conflict needlessly. Yeah, so, so NATO's probably the best example of where they've done a little of that. The real problem is when you look at, say, France, France holds their stockpile specifically for their own national interest. That's why, I mean, yeah, there's prestige involved with it being on the, you know, the P P5 plus one uh, and part of the National Security Council. France held that more, I mean, really that weapons program came about more for prestige, but at the same time, they don't hold any compunctions about announcing that we're going to do what we need to do when it's in our interest. Because they, well, I mean, it's not about, really isn't even about trust anymore, right? With their weapons program, it's about we're going to do what we have to do. And so you have the Russians with thousands of nukes aimed at Europe. And there's always been the worry, right? It's the term uh, trade Berlin for New York. 
right? I think you've heard that in some of the readings that you guys have had this year. Um, and I don't know. I mean, if I was the president, I, you know, I personally, I value Europe, I value NATO, and I would say, oh yeah, I'm gonna jump right on that. But now when you're st talking about nuclear conflict where millions of people could die, if the bargaining ship was that Berlin just got vaporized and the Russians are ready to launch a hundred more, what, what, you know, what is that the, you know, would the negotiations stop there and would Berlin be gone and no retribution be, a, be had per se against Russia? I don't know, it's a very tough scenario, right? So um, part of that assurance side of the deterrence model is that there are no, no doubts I'm gonna support Japan, no doubts I'm gonna support uh, the Republic of Korea, no doubts that Germany, France, UK, Poland, those guys are my quintessential um, friends, brothers, sisters, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat them like I would any city in the United States. You, I mean, it has to be clearly delineated, otherwise the assurance idea right? Helping our partners kind of stalls, right? If you have any kind of fault, you know, if it's the administration, from the state's position, you have to be clear and delineated from how you feel about your allies. So that when you talk about building partnerships, I think this is Japan and Korea, right? NATO, as I mentioned, um, that delineation is important so that it deters our enemies, our adversaries. They're not really our enemies, but Russia and our Russia, China, Korea is our adversary knows that we're going to back our partners um, 100%. I got a weird, just kind of an aside because I saw this is a the J55 gave us these slides, and this is the an SSBN pulling into fast lane Scotland. And we've all seen in the last year all the Brexit votes and, and uh, independence votes. Scotland uh, was, was in the middle of their election process during all the Brexit, and part of that referendum to, for independence to walk away from the UK. Well, that's where, Fastlane is where all the SSBNs for the UK are and where they're housed. So, although the, excuse me, the referendum didn't go through, there was a big worry, so where are they gonna move all this store all the nukes, move all the nukes, and operate all the UK SSBNs again, you know, 200 different weapons. Uh, so, yeah. Nimble Titan, uh, earlier we talked about uh, integrated missile defense. Uh, Nimble Titan is a partner allied exercise that is run uh, around the globe. Uh, I forget where this 2016 event took place, um, but you can see all the different people watching and they basically run scenarios, basically tabletop drills as to what we would do in this situation or that situation with our partners, kind of what we're talking about, assurance, uh, NATO and, and allied partners, so that we can better present a more unified uh, defense, unified reaction to our adversaries. That's General Carbler, our two-star <coughs> staff, uh, visiting different uh, bilateral talks. This is Northeast Asia bilateral talks here. Ooh, I thought I had more. So where did you guys fit in? We're not done with the talk, but where you guys fit in is what I was talking about earlier. I have a physics degree. I studied international affairs on the side when I was going to school, and then when I graduated, I joined the military, became an intelligence analyst, and along the way, all the things that people write about or ask questions about shade how we do business. So from a, from a military side of the house, as I was uh, talking to Professor Whitlark about earlier, uh, on the Academic Alliance website that we have, we, we kind of stage a whole series of questions out to you, the audience, through all these different academic sites. Um, 
while UNL is right there next to us, uh, I don't hold favoritism. I like Georgia Tech. Atlanta, a trip to Atlanta is not a bad deal. And uh, my brother-in-law lives just up north. So not a bad deal to come down here. So we asked a question. Uh, actually, look at me. That's where I graduated from, University of New Mexico. I didn't even know they were on that until I just noticed just now. So um, we asked questions of those uh, partners so that we can come to some of these answers together. Um, and maybe out of the box thinking about a proliferation question that people just hadn't addressed or thought about from a different angle. Um, I read a lot of your first module as I was telling her, where they talk about all the different proliferation models. And as I was reading through it, I was like, yeah, but those aren't the ones I use or think about or in this way. And it's, it's interesting to see how all those perspectives can shade how you think about a problem, because now I'm thinking about some of that stuff. Um, you, the uh, student, approaches outcomes. Here's your education. And you in the middle, all this kind of meets and meets. And somehow or another, we create a, a guy like me who had no idea that I would be a WMD SME for the community, supervising my analysts who are one deep, essentially, watching each country, um, Korea, Russia, China. Pakistan, India, there's a proliferation problem. Um, let me just skip to this slide. Before this, after this slide is about countries at that point. Um, let's just, let me kind of give you my, what is proliferation or what is WMD 101? So from a US STRATCOM or Steve Shula's point of view, there's, there's really two or three types of proliferation. The first type of proliferation is country X has a nuclear weapon, country Y does not. Country X shares technology or information to country Y. Simple transfer of technology, simple transfer of information, just information and technology. Um, we really have never seen a physical movement of weapons being transferred from, from point A to point B. Um, it's pretty old. Uh, it's pretty, uh, back, even back in the day when we were talking about AQ Khan, that would be out of the park bold for Pakistan to do something like that. So we don't tend to see that sort of thing going on. Uh, the other type of proliferate, go ahead. So for type one, would you consider the relationship between the United States and South Korea would fit into that category? So, so that's a dip, so, for, for that, what I would look at that relationship between South Korea and Japan, and even some of the other countries like Germany, where the United States says, we're gonna provide you with an umbrella, nuclear umbrella, so that you don't have to invest in that. So that's the prevention of proliferation. While South Korea, Germany, and Japan all have the, I'll be clear with you, I call those quasi-nuclear states. They have the power to, if they decide or make that decision to go down that pathway, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of international sanctions or international community efforts that's going to deter them once they make that decision, right? The, the power in the community, the power in that country, technology as well as like you have, you have a centrifuge program, I think. I don't know if you have a reprocessing program, but you have all the tool sets currently in South Korea that if you decide to go down that route, you as a country could do that. Japan might be able to do it a little quicker because they have more physical infrastructure. Germany has more physical infrastructure because of their European interweaving for nuclear power with France. So um, if they decide to make a bomb, the United States, while their mind would be blown and be greatly disappointed, technically couldn't prevent that from happening. So that's why we are so aggressive in the partnership side of the house to say, look, we don't, we don't want the proliferation genie to get any more complicated than it is. Every new country that has a nuclear weapon just becomes another complicated um, problem that whether they're friends, allies, there's still complicated calculus when, you, when uh, you brought up earlier about how, how the, the countries integrate together, 
right? So now I'm going to add South Korea and Japan with nuclear weapons to my integration problem in Northeast Asia, which is not unlike the problem that we have in NATO. So the, the whole how I handle those is very difficult from a command perspective or a U.S. policy perspective. So for us, it's easier for me to control the weapons and, pro and provide that assurance to say that I'm going to be there for you and, and then follow through. Um, the second proliferation deal that I see out there is the expansion of an existing stockpile. I know that sounds weird, but if you can imagine a Russian stockpile of, that's come down from the 10,000s over the last two decades since the Cold War ended, right? We've come down from the 10,000 level down to what we're going to be at new start here in February. The levels are really essentially going to be about 15 to 1,700 strategic weapons. Let's be clear, that doesn't cover non-strategic nuclear warheads, which is a problem because we've got about 2,000 of them. Um, my guess my backup slides show that graphic pretty well. Um, non-strategic nuclear warheads, or what we would call tactical nuclear weapons, wasn't part of the treaty bargaining chip back in the day. The Russians like to do that. They like to keep their toys off of the bargaining chip and then bargain away their old material and bargain away anything that could put them in jeopardy, right? So the United States sold, bought off on it. And, um, while I don't necessarily appreciate where we stand in the new start, that's Steve. And we'll see where we go come February going forward. Uh, new start uh, is basically good till 2021 where the, it either has to be renegotiated, re-upped, changed, talked about. Uh, some of the things I talked about on my notes here uh, coming forward for proliferation, INF violation, right? Intermediate nuclear forces that are the 500 kilometers to the 5,500 kilometer range of weapons, tactical weapons that really put a lot of your regional countries at risk. So there's th that form of proliferation where um, you can see an, an expanse in areas that, you know, we're coming down on the strategic side with Russia and they're coming down on those numbers, but at the same time we're going up on the tactical side. There's been a crossover point that's occurred actually just in the last, I don't know, I think in the last year uh, in open source they've showed that. And I might have that on my backup slide as well. Go ahead. Has there ever been a case where the expansion of the nuclear umbrella has also led to proliferation of weaponry? So it could be argued that maybe the case in North Korea. I mean, I, we could have that. I mean, I've had that debate inside my team of civilians and in our headquarters, Intel and headquarters building that. Providing a nuclear umbrella with a country who feels that they're at risk could be enough to make that country decide to go down that path. Um, it could be, I mean, you're looking at Korea. Um, a, a part of me wants to say Pakistan has a lot of those similarities to Korea as to why they went down the way they went. Um, I mean, granted, India is a border country. They got nukes, but they really weren't investing in the nukes the same way. Um, it was more for prestige at first. But Korea is a really good example of why that may be the case. Granted, it's an autocratic country. They can't afford the nuclear program, and yet they still have one. So some domestic internal, right? So having it, they can go, oh, we have the nuclear weapon. We have a nuclear bomb. Uh, now that they have a thermonuclear weapon, now they can say it even louder to their people who are starving or have worms or, or dying from famine. Uh, other questions? So, so uh, let me bring up another, it's not really proliferation, but when we talk about, the DOD has a policy of countering weapons of mass destruction. It's a form of counter proliferation, right? They're, they're in that circuit 
Uh, my team was originally responsible for two aspects of countering weapons of mass destruction. One was what we talked about here, stopping other states from sharing technology or understanding those types of states that are expanding the technologies they have or growing them. And then the other part of countering weapons of mass destruction was getting in the middle of those sharing agreements and, and, and countering that proliferation, stopping the ability for country X to help country Y, even if it was just with technology that was dual use, but had nuclear aspects that could be applied to say missiles and nuclear technology. So, there, so with those two aspects, on that first slide that I showed you, US SOCOM took over the countering and the proliferation um, envelope of that problem. Why? Because they have snake eaters who actually go out and maybe interfere or interdict as part of their mission. Now they work with country programs, they'll call, uh, you know, they'll call the State Department to work with the Chinese to stop them from selling a particular weapon or a particular type of uh, electronic component to the Pakistanis because it might make their weapon smaller or better. They'll do those things still too, but at the same time, US SOCOM has the right types of assets to get in there and, and work the interdiction side of the WZ mission. Whereas my team, after we passed it off to US SOCOM, uh, after about, uh, we've had that, we had that mission at STRATCOM for about seven years. Uh, when they passed that off to SOCOM, that left us with the deterrence and assurance side, the weapons technology, the, um, the capability side of the WMD mission set. So um, it's kind of a nuance. Like, so, I, so really there's two problems, and then there's the, how you get in the middle of those two problems, understanding them. Other questions? So, um, while I don't doubt that there's enough on the STRATCOM portfolio with the existing nuclear countries, mm -hmm. uh, do you have um, the time to pay attention to who might be next? So, so those quasi-countries, so I have all my 1 deep analysts who are following the key countries, and they're inundated, inundated with that mission. Uh, they actually need people to help them out people to help them out, right? New hires um, that could come in and, and work underneath them and learn the, the, the mission, right? Internships or things of those 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 factors where um, not unlike journalism, like my, I was telling you earlier, my daughter is working on, it's a similar kind of fashion on how you report those things up to the four star. So uh, to answer your question, um, I don't have enough people to follow that. That doesn't mean that we don't follow it. Uh, when the four star asks me a question about Argentina tomorrow, I'm going to go, what? Argentina? What brought that on? Uh, I'm going to go do the research, or I'll have done some portfolio research already, uh, or have contacts in the community who can quickly charge to my help or my aid. Um, one of the key one of the key mission sets that we emphasize for my WMD portfolio is not only helping the four star by providing him tailored intelligence so that he can do his mission every day, but we're also integrating with DOE, CIA, DIA, NASIC, uh, MISIC, the Missile Space Intelligence Center, NASIC is the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. Um, we're integrating with those intelligence agencies so that I can not only be integrated with what they're doing or producing on a regular basis, but also have those networks and tendrils so that when something does come up that's odd or a thermonuclear event comes off and you're like, oh, well, who should I contact about that? I know the right scientists who know seismic events, uh, who know underground uh, weapons studies, and they know exactly what to make of the actual scientific data that comes out of those. Um, so that's a, a key important aspect. As for, like I said, I don't know if it helps to answer the question. You know, I have folders on all my quasi states. What's in them varies. Uh, I'm always fascinated. Every now and then I'll open up a folder and be like, I don't know a lot in this. And I'll spend the day 
researching that country to make sure that I haven't missed anything over the last year or two. If that helps. Other questions? So the second part of the presentation is really talking about countries. We don't have to talk about countries in order. I can skip forward. Are there any countries you want to talk about first? Anything? Anyone? I sort of talked about Russia already from a proliferation point of view. While their strategic stockpile is coming down, the numbers of weapons that they have is going up. The, the uh, flexibility in their arsenal is completely different than what it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, the arsenal 20 years ago was very structured triad, submarines, silos, uh, and air forces that were deployed to the force and they were all aimed at the United States. Today it's mobile missiles, it's um, a, a refreshed submarine force, uh, they're making brand new submarines uh, for the SSBN mission now uh, at will. Granted, economics plays a role as to how fast those things roll out. They're doing bomber, modernization. The nuclear infrastructure, which amazingly I can talk about at the unclass level more than I can some of the other things, has undergone an amazing refresh, is a good way to say it. Uh, in the past few years, since probably 2010, the nuclear weapons uh, development and building infrastructure in Russia is, which was always uh, head over heels an industrial project, right? Um, where we've allowed our industrial capacity to decline. Um, in Senate testimonies, I think the number was less than a dozen a year. And on the Russian side, it's in the hundreds per year to make a nuclear warhead. Uh, so while our warheads are good, uh, high grade, you know, where the Russians are just now catching up to our, what we would call 80s level technology, um, more modernized nuclear force. Uh, ours has been there for a while. And when it's been there for a while, then you need to take it back into the shop and check it out, which we do. And we haven't seen any problems with the stockpile in that regard. But as I said here, you, know, you got a modernizing strategic force, newer things, newer technology, newer command and control is a harder target to deter, correct? It may even give them a little bit of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Russians may have a little bit of um, uh, a bravado because their stuff is newer and they think ours is older and maybe not as good because of the age. So kind of a hard, hard sell, right? To deter, to tell a Russian, hey, my 30 year old stuff is as good as your five year old stuff. It's a hard sell. So that's part of that deterrence and assurance problem that we're now faced with. Um, in the next 10 years, I think we're investing nearly a trillion dollars, 100 billion a year to upgrade and modernize our own strategic stockpile. Are we gonna produce hundreds of nuclear weapons? No, not gonna go there. We're gonna refurb, we're gonna take the ones that we have, retool them, refurb them, and put them back on the weapons that they've been on for many a year. Um, you know, we're gonna go LRSO, we're gonna go with new submarine programs, new uh, uh, future bomber, right? New strat stealth bomber. Questions? Another, go ahead. Uh, how do we change our deterrence posture to be more effective against Russia since obviously it's not being as effective as we want it to be? So, honestly, my personal opinion, they want to talk to us. It's a very weird dynamic. The, uh, the end of the Cold War, put Russia on a lower tier as a world power because of its economic status. Um, and that just never set well with them. And so in my personal opinion, 
Uh, Steve Shula thinks that a lot of the, uh, the um, adventurism that the Russians do is specifically to get us to come to the table, specifically to get us to talk about INF, because they really don't want to deploy an INF treaty busting. They want to stay a part of INF, they, but they want us to come to the table and have a man-to-man -man talk global power, superpower to superpower talk about these issues that are bothering them and bothering us. Um, the big deal that's bothering Russia right now is deploying an IMD system into Europe, using Poland and Czechoslovakia with radars and, and, and putting uh, missile interceptors there. That just That's driving them bonkers. Um, and so when you go to that model, and we basically go, eh, we're not going to talk to you about it. We're going to deploy those because we're afraid of a future Iranian threat or we're afraid of a Korean threat down the road. We're going to deploy those there and we're going to ignore your position. Well, so what do you do? So you develop a weapon that can destroy it. Uh, on my backup slides, I call them HGVs, right? Hypersonic glide vehicles for the engineers out there. The new wave of uh, intercontinental ballistic missile that can maneuver at super mock speeds and reach its target. And, and uh, they're highly maneuverable and they pretty much avoid the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the missile defense systems. Can't target them at that speed and can't accurately project. So that's, I mean, as a direct consequence, they've gone down those paths. China's going down the HGV path in the same exact way. So in, in not, negotiating we kind of so they said well okay you're not going to negotiate we're going to develop weapons to counter it and so we've gotten into a weird where in the old days it was missile versus missile versus missile versus missile now we have cyber now we have hgvs we have um, tactical systems we have um, asymmetric warfare fighting a, fighting a war in ukraine without actually being there, you know, where truth doesn't matter. So that, that, that kind of adventurism is a direct consequence of the 20 years of kind of pushing aside. I think if we just came to the table on a bi more bilateral, good broker, it would make a difference. That's just what I think. Um, so go ahead. Just about three more minutes, so if there are any other oh, wow, questions. That's fast. 50 minutes flies when you're on fun. So if there are any other questions, I would suggest we get them out onto the table now. Go ahead. So were you going to expand more on the India Pakistan relationship? Sure. So I know I don't have a lot of time, but let me tell you, this is the uh, this is my jacket that I've been working now for about 20 years. Almost 20 years since I came in, the first thing I got was India and Pakistan, and I've been following it ever since. Um, succinctly, uh, the question about Russia adventurism is a complete model right here for Pakistan and India. As soon as Pakistan got the nuke in the 80s uh, through the AQ Khan program, they now felt emboldened to do the other sidelong things that they had always wanted to do, get back Kashmir, pay India back for what's now Bangladesh or East Pakistan. Um, and so you have a terrorism state, essentially a terrorist state, um, and they're emboldened through their nuclear weapons program. The nuclear weapons is their guarantee that the Indians aren't gonna just come crashing across the border tomorrow. Um, in 01, when I first got to JICPAC as a watch officer, uh, it was just after 9-11, we were doing all those the stuff that we were doing in Afghanistan, and then a uh, probable LT parliament bombing occurred in, in uh, India um, that the Indians blamed on ISI operatives from uh, Lashkar Taiba. And uh, you ended up having, over the next 12 to 15 months, half a million people, half a million troops on the Pakistani side and a million troops on the Indian side. Um, and like what we're doing now, where we have all my leadership flying around to provide assurance to our allies in Northeast Asia and or in DC, 
they kind of did the exact same thing over India and Pakistan. They flew diplomats from the State Department. They flew three and four stars and PACOM commander and the CENTCOM commander flew in and out of Pakistan so that at no time during about a 10 month period, there wasn't an American dignitary in one of the countries. And the primary specific purpose of that was to prevent nuclear war. Since that happened, some of the things we learned as outcomes was that it was likely that they had nuclear weapons out during that event and were willing and ready to shoot them at one another. There's no animosity lost uh, between either side. How the Indians perceive their nuclear program is a lot like the French model. They first got nukes as a, uh, they wanted to be invited to the Nuclear Security Council, they still do. They think that a billion people should be represented. Um, I'm not one to probably argue that point, um, but they haven't been invited. They, uh, they will argue when you talk about the proliferation model between, if anybody tries to compare them to Pakistan, they're like, whoa, 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 we've never shared our technology, we've never, you know, done nuclear blackmail, we haven't done this, this uh, terrorist, um, position, and we've been a good broker for the nuclear program. I mean, look, we have inspectable places that the IEA can come in. Not all their nuclear facilities are inspectable, but, but a good majority of them are. So the Indians look at themselves as a good good uh, nuclear supplier group, nuclear proliferation treaty type member, even though they're not. Um, and on the other side, the Pakistanis will do what they can to deter India from getting that, because if that ever happened, then the Indians would have leverage, right? So there's a there's a treaty, there's it's the adventurism thing again, right? One side is pressing on the other. How does Pakistan press the test against India? They use their friend China. A lot. China is helping them with their missile program. China helps them help them with their nuclear program. Um, clearly this when we had the mission of countering WMD, this problem, the India PAC challenge, was our number one risk at the command. Like all the other risks, like we have old plans for, like Russia, China, you know, plan against that adversary just because they have nuclear weapons. But this one, we're not planning against it from a, we need to target that country. We're planning at it when they fight one another and a nuclear holocaust occurs on the South Asia plateau, what the heck? What is that, what is it gonna do to calculus for nuclear weapons use or whatnot? And on that Complex. Note, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately we have run out of time. I suspect we can talk to you for the rest of the afternoon. Oh,